going to be very helpful if you can have a Bible to hand now, please. A Bible. Okay, sorry I, if that sounded strange. Um, so, I don't know where you go for Bibles. The other thing I'd like to do is to reconstitute the music group for a moment. This is a daring thing. Could you come back? Don't worry about PowerPoint or anything, please. This is fine. <clears throat> Today is Trinity Sunday, and underlying the readings and the message will be an exploration of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there happens to be a song which somehow embodies and explains and celebrates Trinity, which we've sung. Is Keith going to join? Oh, he's getting Bibles as well. He's multitasking. Good, okay. Now, I'm going to have three choirs, if we could. Um, Keith, you're, you're going to be number one, is that right? Uh, no. Who's this, number one? Okay. I'm like number one. Right. So, of course, you're in the middle. Uh, no, I think we'll have to... Yeah, okay. put, him, put him number one, then. Okay, can we have his... No, can you start number one? Okay. Is that right? Right. Could you over there... I just hope there is a Pavarotti among you. Could you be choir one with Keith, Okay. Choir two, sing Dolce, right, because there are more of you. Will you sing the second choir? And over here, third choir, okay? So your choir leader here, your choir leader in the middle, right? So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Just remember that. If you've read the shack, this might prepare you and, and help you. So what we're going to do is all you do, just to remember the words, Father, I adore you, lay my life before you, how I love you. Right, you sing that, and then you carry on. Next verse, you will do that, won't you? Keith, yep. you promised me you'll go straight through. <laughs> Father, Son, okay. And then when I bring you in, second choir, okay, you carry on and simply sing it all the way through. And third choir likewise. Let's trust each other, okay? If all else fails, I've got my guitar here, and well, you know, okay. But what you will find is we are singing different words at the same time, and we're singing of three people, Father, Son, and Spirit, but they're one. And that's the whole point. They're one in harmony, and they're one as, as polyphony. There we are. Let's see how we go. So, just remind ourselves of the tune, could we? Yeah, we'll sing it all through, all together, Wait, once. Go, what are we going to do? We'll sing it all together once, just so that we're really oh, good, clear. Right. Look, this is getting better and better and better, <laughs> really. Yes, that's right, okay. And then we'll stop. Good. And then we will start again. And then we're going to do that bit, are we? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, this is a practice, <laughs> but remember Trinity Sunday. Yeah. Oh, now we can. Okay, yes. right, okay. Yes. Look, so this, you've got to have faith, and there won't be a pause between verses, no, no. we'll keep going, okay? No. So, are you ready, choir one? I'll join you as well, but we're going to get you going. So, when I point to you, can you start and keep going to the end? Your privilege is you'll hear others singing when you finish, all right? Just Two, three, four. Four.
Dear friends, that is so beautiful. What I'm going to ask is we do it once more, because you, you're understanding how we do it, it's not complicated. Things then get brought together. Can you listen, listen to the sound this time? It's one thing in a choir to do, I'm singing my part, but it's another thing to be listening to others. This is very, very beautiful. So can we, just a little introduction. Is that all right? Just once more. Yeah. I'm sorry if you don't get paid overtime for this. <laughs> I think that, in many ways, says it all. Trinity Sunday. It's a good time to explore our understanding of God in three persons. In this particular part of the world, we recognize that for some Muslims and Hindus, the concept of God in three persons is very strange. Muslims because that's too, too many, and Hindus because that's many, too few. And it's a challenge to us all, if you think about it, something of a paradox. I think the simple chorus, Father, we adore you, is one of the most beautiful ways of representing three in one. We've just done it. It didn't require great intellectual ability or musical ability we found ourselves singing three in one. Just to set your <clears throat> um, thoughts going in relation to the Bible about Trinity, just a couple of things for you to bite on. In the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, something that many people may not notice that is that the name for God in Genesis, one of the names for God is Elohim. That is plural. When it seems that God appears to Abraham, there are three visitors. And in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah encounters God, he says, holy, holy, holy. Not twice, you with me? Or four times, but holy, holy, holy. Right from the beginning of Genesis, we find the spirit hovering like a dove. We'll come back to that in a moment, okay? So, just Trinity. Something else to bite on is John's Gospel. Now, you know this. So these are just things to bite on. If you, if you were with me in lectures at Spurgeon's, I like to give people chunks to bite on. The word for God in Genesis is plural. Bite on it. And now, John's Gospel. <clears throat> I was brought up on the authorised version. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without him was not anything made. Oh, there we are. That's how it was. I'm so grateful my grandparents taught me the authorised version. If you split me up, it's the authorised version that comes out. <laughs> when Erasmus 
was charged for the first time, historic moment, to move from the Latin Vulgate and to start harmonizing it with the Greek. And he came to the word logos, that's the Greek word logos. In the beginning was the logos, translated word. <coughs> he realized there were three Latin, don't worry about this, but three Latin words, sermum, verbum, and oratio. Don't worry about that at all. But he wondered what the best word for word was. And he's, he, his conclusion was the best word was the word translated conversation. Listen to this, my friends. In the beginning was the conversation. And the conversation was with God. And the conversation was God. This is the beginning of John's Gospel. If you then bite on this and read through John's Gospel, you find the whole of John's Gospel is Jesus inviting other people to join the conversation. Nicodemus, the woman at the well, right the way through to Peter at the barbecue. Peter, I want to have a conversation with you. Do you love me? It's as though John's Gospel is saying from the beginning of the world there has been Father, Son and Holy Spirit in relationship and what I'm seeking to do through Jesus is to invite you through his death, through his blood, through his life to become part of the conversation. And what's our destiny, my friends? Is our destiny in heaven to hear more words? Words, words, words? Or is it to be at a family table? You know the right answer, don't you? Joining in a conversation. Sitting beside Jesus, our saviour and friend. In the presence of the Father. With the Spirit somehow always breathing life into the proceedings. Anyway, I've given you two things to bite on about Trinity, one in the Jewish scriptures and one in the New Testament. Now there are three times in the life of Jesus, really very pivotal, most important times, <clears throat> when Father, Son and Holy Spirit are together and described working together. The first is the birth of Jesus, the incarnation. The second is the baptism. We're coming back to that in a moment. Thrilled to have the baptistry behind me. There's no water in it, is there? No, so I just warn you. Just if this morning you get convicted, we've got to do something before you're baptized. And the third is what I've called the commission, but this is the death, the resurrection, the ascension and Pentecost. This is Jesus beginning to hand over to his body, the, the church. In the incarnation, you know, the birth of Jesus, what is it all about? Well, it is that the birth of Jesus is God's gift to the world. You celebrate that at Christmas time. God so loved the world that he gave. Who did he give? His only begotten son. But let's remind ourselves, how was the son conceived? Anyone like to hazard a guess? By the Holy Spirit. There we have it. So without us being heavy about it, the birth of Jesus is the Trinity working together. You see, no, no great point being made. It just happens. The Father gave the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the means by which the Son was conceived and born. If you go to the end of the life of Jesus, the commission, the death, resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost, Jesus the Son bears the sins of the world on the cross. The Father, in my view, amazingly, is willing to stand by, broken-hearted, at the agonizing death of his Son. That's a bit often overlooked. And then the Father raised him to life on the third day. Let's just get our theology right. God raised him from the dead. Not Jesus woke up. The Father, having heard the world say no to the gift he gave, on Easter day said yes. Hallelujah, yes. I have accepted the gift of my son. And now I will give him a name above every name. The Father comes into his own. This isn't Jesus 
boasting or doing anything. It's the father saying, son, thank you. You've done everything that was ever asked of you. And now, son, I'll take over. And then, of course, at Pentecost, we find that the son says, wait. Wait until what I promise comes. That lovely reading from John's Gospel. Let me just remind you of that one, one of the phrases we heard. Jesus said, The counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. That's Pentecost. Have you got it? Effortlessly, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not, no one needs to draw attention to it and underline it. For this is how it is, God in three persons. With that in mind, this morning, we're going to use the baptism of Jesus as an example, a picture of how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together. And then what we'll do is look at the implications for us. I hope by the God's Spirit, these implications will begin to dawn on you. Now, one of the things that can happen when with words is that words can I don't know what they you can have words that have an effect but they don't add up to a picture and that's why when working on a book on art in the Bible this is one of the things I do write books um, I chose pictures where artists are representing stories from the Bible and if you'd like to look at this, this is one of the most famous of the baptism. Now the thing about an artist is an artist can't hide things. What I mean is if you're going to do a picture of the baptism, you've got to decide was Jesus immersed or was he anointed? Where was the dove? And who heard the voice of the Father? Anyway, these things, if you're an artist, you have to make decisions. Sometimes wordsmiths, including theologians and ministers, we can focus on one thing and leave the rest fuzzy. So this morning what I'd like to do is to ask you to have your picture of the baptism of Jesus in mind and now let's fill it in. When I was a student I had the privilege in 1969 of living for a time in Israel and so one of the places that I visited was the River Jordan. So I've got very, very, a very clear image of the River Jordan, possibly near the spot where John baptised. So what's the role in the baptism of Jesus of the Father? Let's just, just take, we'll take the picture apart for a moment. If we start at the beginning of the story from John's Gospel, we realise that Jesus is God's gift to the world. The gospel in a nutshell is John 3.16, which goes... Come on, keep going. I'm going to tell Andrew. That's good. He'll be pleased. <laughs> Some of you got the authorised as well. That's really good. Not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. There we are. So that's, that's where the story starts. So long before the baptism, we've got the gift of God's son. But he was not... So he wasn't the son of an earthly father. Something else we learn before the baptism from Luke's gospel was that Jesus as a boy understood he had a unique relationship with the father. To his parents, earthly parents, did you not know I must be about my father's business? Do you remember when he was a boy he went to Jerusalem? So Jesus the son is talking about his heavenly father. Okay. At the age of 30, we haven't got much more of the story, Jesus comes to the Jordan and surprises John. John is, I mean, gobsmacked, quite frankly. That's not in the authorised version. Um, because this is the wrong way round. He knows, John, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Come on. And he's coming for baptism. And Jesus says, let it be so in this way. What's this about? Um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll find, follow that through. And... Then Jesus is baptised. I want to follow the role of the Father in this. When Jesus comes out of the water, the voice of the Father is heard. Now I'm afraid quite often in films it's sort of American. 
Um, and that's difficult. But what I'd like you to do is to strip that voice of all the baggage and to go back to the dawn of creation. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. You read? Okay. And there was light. And now, the one who said when he'd made things, he'd made light and day and sea and land and so on. Remember he said, that's good. That's good. And now he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Wow. Wow. Something I have to confess to you, I don't have to confess, but I'm going to confess it to you, is that um, I struggle when awarding marks um, in universities around the world. Um, those of you who've been my students will know that because I never give marks higher than the ones I got. The trouble was I didn't get very good ones. Um, and so the best I ever got at university was uh, not a mark, it was my, my Don wrote the word sensible. I asked what that meant. It said, you know, almost the pits, but just a bit better. My friends, when God said, this is my boy, I'm thinking of a Jewish father now, really, but this is my boy. I'm well pleased with him. That's the highest of standards. Are you with me? This is not compromising. This is the very, very best. And when the voice speaks, there is that wonderful sense of a harmony, a relationship, father and son. Not that Jesus was surprised. It echoes the words of Psalm 2, by the way, verse 7, my son. But also, if we had, if we had Hebrew as our language, and we went back to the story of Abraham and Isaac, we'd find that John in his gospel has echoed exactly the words of Abraham and Isaac. Take your son, your beloved son, your only son. You find that the, 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 the way these words are written echo the message of Abraham and his son Isaac. I don't want to say any more, but that's something to bite on. And this is the great announcement that sets in motion the ministry and mission of Jesus. If you're asking about mission and ministry of Jesus, what's he doing for the next three years? What are we about? It's all in these words. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased and that the transfiguration, listen to him. This is my son. So from this moment on, the world is to know this is my son. God the Father saying, in effect, the whole of me is in my boy. I'm quoting, of course, from the epistles. The exact likeness, everything. And now what you will see in Jesus, my boy, is me walking through my world. You will see how I want you to live, how I want you to act, how I created you to act. Everything is in harmony. And through thick and thin, for three years of his ministry, this relationship of father and son runs strongly all through. Jesus is in daily communication with his father by prayer. The disciples are astonished by how little sleep Jesus has. Why? Because he's always talking with the father. Every now and then we hear in Gethsemane, we hear something of the prayer. Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. We hear a bit of the prayer. But don't think that was just Gethsemane. For three years... The relationship between father and son has been the axis around which the life of Jesus is working. There is just one painful interruption to the relationship. Some of you may know this. It's when on the cross, Jesus cries using not the word Elohim, but the word Eloi. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And now, once in his life and prayer, he does not say Father, he says God. And why is that? You know. Because at that point, he's bearing the sin of the world. And at that point, he just is absorbed and contaminated by the sin of the world, a world that is cut off 
from the father he loves and who loves him so dearly. Anyway, something of the role of the father in the baptism of Jesus. What I'm hoping is you have Matthew's Gospel open um, at, as, as your Matthew's Gospel chapter 3. Now let's just look at the role of the spirit and then we'll look at the role of the son. We'll bring things together. But the whole reason for this is trying to find a way of this making a difference not only a minor difference, but possibly for some of you, uh, opening up a whole new world in our walk with Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What's the role of the Holy Spirit? Well, John the Baptist, through his ministry, saw a special relationship between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Don't need to go back, but in John chapter 3, we read that um, there's going to be I baptize with water, but there comes one who will baptize with Holy Spirit. There we are, you see? Are you with me? Follow this through. No great... There we are. So, um, when we come to the baptism, which is the moment of announcing... This is it. This nobody from Nazareth is now revealed as God's son the one who is to inaugurate a whole new way of living, the kingdom of God. What happens? The heavens open and Jesus saw the Spirit of God. Just trying to be really faithful to the text. Matthew's Gospel. He, that is Jesus, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Difficult to describe the lighting on him. It's almost coming into him it's rather than just you know, it's very very close difficult to imagine how it was for eyewitnesses so here we have a picture which is assuming we're eyewitnesses and in this picture which you can't see too small but we've got a dove right in the middle difficult to imagine what the eyewitnesses saw but Jesus saw the dove the Holy Spirit the one hovering above the waters in the first verses of Genesis. And then, after this, please hold on to something we can often separate. The baptism of Jesus and the 40 days in the wilderness are inextricably linked in the Gospels. And what's the role of the Holy Spirit? Well, verse 1 of chapter 4 then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted, or possibly tested. And that is all part of the inauguration of the ministry of Jesus. It's not that the baptism was it and then something strange happens. What we're talking about is that this is all part of the inauguration. And so, there is the 40-day chapter in the life of Jesus which tests him, and prepares him for how to serve his father. And the Holy Spirit is the one who's led him into that place. To teach him. To teach how to live the kingdom. God's way of doing things. And of course going into the wilderness for 40 days. Is entering again the, the story of the children of Israel. So let's just remember. They went through the Red Sea. And then 40 years. Yes? Yes? He went through the River Jordan in 40 days. Everything in the Gospels shows that Jesus is reliving the story of the people of Israel. He is the embodiment of Israel. Between Egypt and the Promised Land. Between his baptism and his ascension. The underlying question of the testing and temptations is whether Jesus is truly God's son and how he should live and serve God. So the temptations, if you are the son, well hold it a minute, what did the father say? This is my son. <laughs> but the, the tempter is already trying to undermine this because if the tempter can drive a wedge between the father and the son, then victory is secure. Just as the tempter drove a wedge between God the Father and us. Do you see? If he can do it with Jesus, then victory is secure. And by God's grace, 
what happens is that the Spirit is able to bring light to the Word of God, to the Scriptures. Please hold on to that. Without the Scriptures, my friends, we have no foundation. We, we have, it's the Spirit who breathes life into the Scriptures and helps us to understand. And it's so wonderful that Jesus, when really at rock bottom, 40, year, 40 days hungry, I don't know whether you can imagine it, but when you're at rock bottom and you're hallucinating, this is when still the word of God is his rock. What about the role of the son in the story? Look to the role of the father, the spirit. What about the role of the son? As you see, I've had to pick this story apart, and of course artists want to put it all together. The son takes his place in the queue to be baptised. I don't know whether you've ever thought in a bus queue or at Whips Cross Hospital or wherever you go, when you're in a queue, whether you thought of Jesus standing in a queue to be baptised. But he was. John is surprised. Jesus is there not as a sinner, but as one of us. And he's leading the way. One day, he will call his followers to follow him and be baptised. And he never calls us to go where he hasn't been. Right, this is a real leader, isn't it? Not someone who says, right, off you go. I don't understand it, but you know, I've, I've done the theory. You go and see how it is. But someone who says, come on, follow me. This is where I put my step. That's a bit sharp, this is dangerous, whatever it is. He's saying, follow me. And he allows God's chosen prophet, John the Baptist, to baptise him. The last of the prophets. And so there is the continuity with the Jewish scriptures. The last of the prophets baptises Jesus. Oh, wow, this is wonderful, it's coming together. To set him apart for his special unique calling. To anoint him. And then he listens, the son, to his father's voice. And this will remain with him throughout his temptation. And it will remain with him throughout his ministry. He's led by the spirit into the desert. And he is willing to be led into the desert. My friends, you might not have thought of this, but just imagine that the baptism were, as it were, a minister's ordination. Right? Everything's happened, everyone's there. God is present, it's wonderful. And then the next thing that happens is for 40 days the minister just goes alone. Imagine it. I don't know whether you can. But this is counterintuitive. But the son followed. He might have expected to be preaching and teaching. Do you see what I mean? He might have expected to be doing signs and miracles. But 40 days is a long time. And Jesus is willing to be led. It's a time of trial and testing. But every bit of that testing is going to be tested in his life and eventually his death. So the role in the baptism, remind you, the role of Father, Son and Spirit in the birth of Jesus is all there. In the death, resurrection, ascension and Pentecost it's all there. What we've done is to focus on the baptism as an example. Let's bring things together. Separating out the respective roles of each person in this story is to distort the story. But we have to do it in order to understand. In practice, all work together in perfect harmony. Back to, Father, we are... Right? No, there's no, there's no struggle. You were singing different bits. You were singing different words. But there was harmony, was there not? It's so beautiful. Hold on to that. And through the ministry of Jesus, as through the scriptures, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are working in perfect harmony. And eventually in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, which he gives, up, gives to his people, what, we, what do we read? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Notice, baptizing them in the name, not something that's now... Some people have said, all oh, right, that, that comes later. No, no, no. Father, Son and Holy Spirit were always involved in the baptism, if you see what I mean. Now what's happening is this becomes worldwide. And at Pentecost, the relationship 
between Father, Son and Holy Spirit is spelt out just wonderfully and directly by Peter and the Apostles. What God intended, what the Father intended, people tried to thwart. You have killed him on the cross, this Jesus. But he's been raised and now, by God's Spirit, what's happening is that the good news is something you can understand in your own language. What does this mean for us? My sisters and brothers, it's always a challenge when expounding the scriptures to know what by God's spirit he is doing. But I, I want to close by saying this, that I mentioned the, the novel The Shack. I don't know whether any of you read it, but in it there was an attempt, among other things, to describe Trinity. And it had such a profound effect that three people asked to come and see me to discuss the shack from quite different parts of the UK, most unusually. Have you read the shack, Dr. White? Well, can we come and discuss it with you? And they had, you know, quite raw questions to ask. But what had happened was that the shack had disturbed them to think about Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And what I've discovered in preparation for today <coughs> is that people, some you know, like C.S. Lewis, have said the more he's come to understand Trinity, the more he understands that the Christian faith without that is some, well, I don't want to finish the sentence, but it's something like coming to live in, in the Trinity. I would like to conjure up an image. It just happens that part of my training was in Anglo-Saxon under an old Norse and Icelandic under someone called J.R.R. R. Tolkien and in the course designed by C.S. Lewis. And I'd like you to imagine a, a, a blazing fire in a hall, blazing fire, and you've got a, a household together. And at the, in the middle of the table, there is the leader, the father of the household. And then <clears throat> opposite there is the, the beloved son. And you've been invited to be part of the, the meal, part of the celebration. As in the Anglo-Saxon, as a hearth companion, that's the way the phrase is. And you discover <clears throat> that somehow the life there that there is something, you don't know what to call it, but there is spirit there. And that's the Holy Spirit's presence. And one or other of us might have the privilege of sitting next to Jesus. Are you with me now? Let's bring it close. How would you describe him to someone else? My saviour? Would you dare to go further? My friend? When I was baptized, then in heaven received me, my saviour and my friend. Would you be prepared to call him brother? Would you? Because he is. This, the Trinity is inviting you to come in. Come in. Those of you who know about adoption, involved in adoption. Actually, adoption becoming, what can I say, real. And then, can you, can you see the, the way the Father and the Son, if, you, if you're into this picture, can you see the way they're relating, they're communicating? Can you see their body language? Can you? I don't know whether you can, but it's beautiful. Can you see the smile going on? Can you see the jokes? And then you hear, I don't know whether last, last week you heard Prince Charles talk about Your Majesty, Mummy. Any of you remember that? A week's a long time in politics, isn't it, anyway? And then you see Jesus say, Abba. You hear him say, Abba. And he's encouraging you to say, Abba. And when can you say, Abba? When the Spirit leads you. That's New Testament, you see? Trinity is inviting you to come closer, to become part of that family. And always to allow the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to new possibilities. 
to be willing to be tested and tempted, to be willing to see the Holy Spirit's life and new paradigms and so on, to be transformed. For the beautiful thing about Jesus is it, his life gathers up the whole of the story of Israel. It's, it's faithful to the Jewish scriptures, but it's new. The Spirit is doing a new thing. And so with us, if we can inhabit Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we will find we're part of the old, old story. But it's something new every morning. His mercies are as fresh as the morning dew. My friends, words fail, but the music may have said it, and the artists have tried to say it. Join with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit while on earth, and then one day we'll see all this and experience it face to face. And I do pray that you'll be enabled to call the Father Daddy and Jesus Brother by the Spirit. Amen.